Thank you, Professor Wilson. And thank all of you for a very warm greeting to my old haunts of political science. I want to talk this afternoon about the role of public administration in today's world, uh, which the economists tell us is a world of markets and organizations. And there will be sort of equal time given to those two aspects of the situation. It's a special pleasure to give a lecture in the name of John Gauss, whom I became acquainted very early in my career. I found in my files several letters from him dated 1950, 1953. Uh, there may even be a few people in the room here who were alive then. <laughs> <coughs> and it was 64, five years ago, when I first encountered public administration, that John Gauss was undertaking with Leon Wolcott their remarkable study, Public Administration in the United States Department of Agriculture. Dan, Don Smithberg, Vic Thompson, and I uh, made considerable use of that book uh, in our public administration text in 1950. And Gauss and Wolcott's work can come into existence and, uh, excuse me, can continue to throw valuable light on how organizations come into existence uh, and grow often under the influence of technological advances that provide them with potential important new opportunities for service. Now that brings me directly to my topic for today. The mechanisms that make complex organizations effective instruments for carrying out human purposes. <clears throat> and even closer to John Gauss's theme, I should like to ask what kinds of organization structures facilitate change and innovation. I'll talk about both private economic institutions and government, and I think you will see why I have to talk about uh, both of them and their relation to each other. Recently, the Russell Sage Foundation sponsored several uh, conferences involving some Nobel Prize winners in economics who have strayed into political science. I was invited to participate in the conference, but I treasonably defected to my political science origins in order to defend political institutions against the imperialism of utility maximization, competitive markets, and privatization. And I'll have some more to say about those themes also. Because neoclassical economics created a unified framework for explaining, and I put that word in quotes, for explaining virtually all human behavior as produced by an Olympian process of utility maximization that recognizes no limits to the knowledge or thinking power of the human actors. The neoclassical framework assumed a static equilibrium, and as soon as serious attention began to be paid to dynamic considerations, dynamic phenomena, uncertainty, then the, st the structure, particularly as applied to large complex organizations, began to deteriorate and continues to crumble today. Today, economics is in an increasingly chaotic, and I would add, productive state of disorganization. Searching for an alternative picture of economic me mechanisms and human rationality, that is of genuine bounded rationality of the kind of which we people are capable. There are theoretical proposals galore today, experimental economics and economic game theory uh, and whatnot. What's still in short supply is detailed empirical research of kinds that are well known in political science to determine how human beings actually go about solving problems and making decisions. I don't intend to reopen the whole range of questions posed by bounded rationality, but will direct my remarks to just one institutional aspect. Why, in a modern society, do we have markets? And why do we have organizations? And what determines the boundaries between these two mechanisms for social organizations? These questions go to the heart of the role of our diverse political and administrative institutions, public and private, in contemporary society. From an extreme libertarian point of view, both markets and organizations are, of course, unnecessary. For the libertarian, 
Human beings are Leibnizian monads. They're hard, elastic little particles that bounce off each other uh, without either responding to or influencing each other's values. Libertarians on the absurd assumption that my ex the, uh, uh, libertarians proceed on the absurd assumption that my exercise of freedom never affects your ability to exercise yours. Quite the contrary. The freedoms and fates of all six billion of us who occupy this globe are inextricably interwoven. Markets and organizations allow human beings to do together through interchange of information and coordination of activity things they could not do independently. Coordination means simply organizing activity in such a way as to handle the problems that arise because the behavior of each participant depends on the behavior uh, of the others. Something we learn when we visit England and start to cross a street and look in the wrong direction. <laughs> Organizations, some quite large, for example, armies, have been with us since the earliest historic times and earlier. Perhaps for that reason we take them for granted. And they excite in us less wonder than do markets, which developed somewhat later. The most peculiar characteristic of markets, Adam Smith's invisible hand, is their ability to secure coordination without obvious central planning and without a common interest among the participants. For each buyer and seller is supposed to be pursuing independently his or her private interests. But the invisibility of mutual dependence, but this uh, invisibility of mutual independence, the invisible hand, is deceptive. The usefulness of markets depends on a shared knowledge of the prices and characteristics of the goods that are being traded. Depends on the absence of serious third-person effects, so-called externalities, that are not reflected in prices. And it requires sufficient stability of products and manufacturing processes so that both sellers and buyers can plan their activities rationally and make rational decisions to sell and buy at the prices at which the markets equilibrate. They also depend critically on the safety of things like transit routes. The effects upon buyers and sellers of agricultural products of prolonged drought or the effects of closing a strategic strait in a major trade route provide vivid examples of the fragility of markets in the face of uncertainty and the social and human distress that can be caused by that fragility. In order to use markets to provide oil for the lamps of China, oil well owners must know that there exists a land called China, where oil will be used in certain volumes at certain prices for at least the proximate future, long enough to amortize your investment in refineries. And the Chinese buyers will acquire oil lamps only if they believe that oil will be purchasable at a price that makes it competitive with alternative light sources. Substantial stability of manufacturing, consumption, and trade is essential to markets working effectively. And of course, social institutions and governmental organizations in particular play an essential role in maintaining and occasionally in destroying that stability. Now, where there are many Competing commodities, price information may have to be supplemented by product quality information so that buyers can compare competing brands or by government regulations to protect them from injurious products. If we wish to understand how complex markets can be, we can turn to building construction contracts or contracts for manufacturing large custom-built machinery and count how many pieces of information have to pass between designers and builders before a contract can be sealed, and how much daily interaction takes place between seller and buyer while the transaction is being completed. I speak from the heart on that. Our condo, uh, whose council I serve, is going through the process of letting contracts for a new hair, heating and air conditioning system. <laughs> Believe me, uh, markets do not operate without information flowing. Such contracts might, in fact, be as well viewed as agreements to form temporary organizations for the duration of particular jobs. In summary, markets are indeed remarkable coordinating mechanisms 
in the parsimony, generally, are the requirements for information. But they are far less parsimonious than appears at first blush or that suggested by the textbooks. For they require a high degree of economic stability, a low level of externalities in order to operate. Moreover, in important classes of market transactions, much product information must flow in the negotiation of the exchange and in the subsequent manufacturing process. Adam Smith's invisible hand is often highly visible. Consequently, when the qualifying conditions for stability of markets are not met, for example, in wartime, we see a rapid movement towards centralized planning as the preferred coordinating mechanism for many activities. And that historical fact should give us pause for a moment as to where markets and where organizations are the proper solution to our coordination problem. We are so accustomed to hearing our society today described as a market economy that we are surprised to observe that since the time of Adam Smith, 225 years ago, markets have steadily declined and business and governmental organizations have steadily grown as the principal coordinators of economic activity. In Adam Smith's time, almost the only economic organizations beyond the scale of individual families were agricultural estates directly managed by their owners and relatively small shops owned by guildmasters. The putting out system was really a market system, not an organizational system, with a special coordinating role for the, the uh, uh, capitalist who carried these, uh, the flax and then the yarn and then the cloth through the stages of, of manufacture, not in a single factory. Adam Smith himself took a dim view of large organizations where management became separated from the direct oversight of the owner. Looking around for examples in his time, the main ones he found were the universities like Oxford and Cambridge. And it's interesting to read uh, his description of them as inept, inefficient, and corrupt organizations. <laughs> he could claim, in fact, to have anticipated uh, our golden parachutes for salaried executives. Perhaps he was forewarned by the not infrequent peculations of stewards of the estates of the gender and the aristocracy, at least as reported in the novels of those times. But in spite of Smith's skepticism, organizations have grown till the vast bulk of our economy's activity takes place not in markets, but within the walls of individual large business corporations. We don't live in a market economy. But in an organization economy, or at most, in an organization slash market economy, with a predominance of organizations. One of the first industries to move toward this new kind of organizational society was transportation, where the railroads established in turn enormous new widespread markets and thereby enabled uh, a, a highly specialized production in large factories. Electronics is now completing the comparable transforma uh, transformation of communication. The worldwide web and e-markets provide new opportunities of unknown magnitude for coordination at a distance. Today, we have very little information that would enable us to judge whether markets or organizations will be best able to make use of these new opportunities. The fact of e-markets doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to dissolve organizations. As a matter of fact, I've not seen a, a plausible scenario that leads very rapidly in that direction. But coordination, we shouldn't make a hero of coordination. Coordination is not a good, but a necessity. It's costly, it's imperfect, and we wish to introduce no more of it than the structure and intricacies of our goals calls for. Stated a little more positively, organization design balances the gains from coordination against its cost, against each person not being able to do his or her own thing. The first step in designing an effective organization is to determine what kinds of interdependencies in its activities will benefit from coordination, and then to minimize the amount of coordination by dividing the work, we've heard of that before, uh, dividing the work into pieces uh, so that each sub part of the organization can be as nearly independent of its activities uh, as uh, possible. So we have fire departments and police departments and all those other good uh, good things. 